special senses. And uh, we can talk about the ear the same way we did the eye. That is, an outer, middle, and inner. We don't peel the ear like we do the eye, right? It's not a nice round sphere, but we can still do outer, middle, and inner. So let's start on the outer ear. The outermost portion of the ear is called the oracle or the pinna. It's what people commonly think of as your ear. All right, and so its job is to capture the sound waves and direct them into the external auditory meatus, the ear canal. So the sound waves will then will be directed into this external auditory meatus or, or, or the auditory canal. Uh, it's lined with hair cells and uh, wax glands, and the hair cells and the wax glands are there to protect the tympanic membrane and to stop particles, insects, whatever, from, from getting into the, the ear. Uh, I talked to a physician once, uh, and she said pretty regularly with young kids that she would find right that the kid had something in that ear canal, uh, little pieces of gravel. One time she even found an ant uh, crawling around on the tympanic membrane uh, that, that was in there. Uh, and of course, it always that when I heard that story and I talked about the, the external auditory it always makes me think of a, a really old, old uh, outer limits. Uh, it was out of limits. Anyway, long time ago. None of you would have maybe seen this particular show, but I liked it. So it, in the uh, the this program, uh, there were two men living in Africa, and they were both trying to court this this woman uh, that, that lived there in and in the jungle. Uh, they were proper British, all of them, right? And so the two men slept in the same tent, and they were both trying buying for, for this woman's hand in marriage. Well, the one man decided he was gonna take matters into his own hands here, so he hired a native to catch a, an earwig that was in Africa that when you put it in the person's ear, it would eat its way into the brain and kill the person. So he hired the, the native to do this, and the native stuck in the middle of the night and put it in the ear, only he put it in the wrong guy's ear, <laughs> right? And so uh, the man that actually paid the money had horrible pain, the, the earwigs eating its way through the brain, and, and there both the, the woman and the, the friend, he thought it was his friend, really concerned. The doctor comes and uh, they expect him to die, but the earwig comes out the other ear. Right? And they say, oh, this is a miracle, right? The earwig went all the way through and, and uh, he's gonna live. But the doctor looks at the earwig under the microscope and says, oh, it was a female and it laid its eggs. <laughs> so there you go. I don't know what it has to do with anything, but it'll make you lose your sleep at night, right? You'll be worried about earwigs getting in there. Uh, all right. Uh, so still in the outer ear, the innermost part of the outer ear is something called the tympanic membrane or the eardrum. The tympanic membrane or eardrum. So when the sound waves come in, they hit that tympanic membrane and they make it vibrate. You know, somebody pulls up next to you in a car and they've got their bass turned up way too high and your windows in your car start to, to vibrate, right? So those vibrations make things move and makes the tympanic membrane move. That brings us to the middle ear, and the middle ear consists of a cavity with three small bones. Okay? So it's a cavity with three small bones that you know are the auditory ossicles, and you learn them in anatomy, the smallest bones in the body, the malleus, the incus, and the stapes, and they're in that order. So the malleus is connected to the tympanic membrane, and then we have the incus, and then the incus connects to the stapes, uh, stapes is a, like a little stirrup, and it sits into, uh, fits into uh, the inner ear, into the cochlea in the area that we call the oval window. All right, so it's oval shaped because the bottom of the stapes is, is oval shaped. <clears throat> Attached to those auditory ossicles, there are small little muscles. Um, Well, there are small little muscles attached to that, that area. 
um, that allow you to dampen down the sounds that you hear. So that when I'm talking, if I didn't have these nice little muscles to pull on my ossicles, the sounds that I'm making would sound incredibly loud. Uh, so it dampens down those, those sounds uh, and protects the earphone. And so when you hear really loud noises, those muscles pull on these uh, obstacles and tighten down so the vibrations don't get past into the inner ear as, as much. Uh, I read an article once that said that, that sometimes uh, when people are shooting handguns, they're taught to hum before they shoot the handgun to help protect their ears. Right, so that if they hum, it causes those muscles to tighten, and then the ossicles won't move as much. So I always thought it's probably a good thing to know that if right somebody's pointing a gun on at you and they start to hum, it's <laughs> with the uh, damage from um, having your headphones turned up too high be because those muscles just get used to pulling no. and dampening? So Nan's asked about the damage from exposure to excessive sounds. Turns out that's in the organ of fourteen. We'll, we'll get to that in. We'll look at that. Uh, now, that is a cavity, I said, and so we have a, a, a tube that runs from the middle ear out to the pharynx. We call it here the auditory tube, or it's called the eustachian tube. Right? So auditory tube or eustachian tube. I'd like you to know both terms. Right? So auditory tube or eustachian tube. Uh, and this is a pressure relief tube for pressure that is accumulating in that middle ear. So you know that when you go up in altitude, your ears pop. They pop because as we go up in altitude, gases expand. There's less atmospheric pressure, and that atmospheric pressure pushes out. It needs to be able to go somewhere, or it'll make that tympanic membrane bulge it can go out the eustachian tube, and as it leaves in little spurts, you hear the popping sound uh, that, that you hear. Wouldn't um, that be when you go down? And it's gonna happen when you come down as well, because if you're up at a high altitude and you come down, you need to let more air in. So we actually okay. will occur in both directions. If you're a diver and you need to go under the ocean, right, you're gonna need to try to increase the pressure, and very commonly divers learn to air their nose and blow, right, to try to increase the pressure, yeah. When you put tubes in your kid's ear, is that opening up the eutachian tube yeah, as well? Hang on just a second. So oh, okay. we'll, we'll get to that in just, just a minute. So, uh, right, so as we go up in altitude, gases expand. Um, if I filled the balloon here at sea level, and I took the balloon to Lake Tahoe, what would the balloon look like at Lake Tahoe? It'd be much larger, right? And then if I had the balloon in Lake Tahoe, came back to sea level, it would be smaller. Again, having to do with, with atmospheric pressure. Um, I remember as a teenager, the first time I ever went to Lake Tahoe, uh, I went in to get some potato chips in the supermarket, and I got really excited about the potato chip. I was like, whoa, they sell really big bags of potato chips up here, right? They were huge. I thought, this is great. Bought the bag, went out, opened it up, so I, but it was just all air, right? So they had filled the potato chip bag at sea level, hauled it to Lake Tahoe, and the gas was simply expanded, just like what happens in the <coughs> So <clears throat> we need this, this canal, this tube to be open. If it becomes plugged, air cannot get out. Uh, if you have a young child, and you decide to go on an airplane flight with the young child, when they pressurize an air cabin, they don't bring it back to sea level pressure. And so as you go up in altitude, you probably notice that your ears pop. If the baby has uh, an, any kind of an ear infection or is even congested, they may not be able to let the air out. The pressure builds up, and so you might notice you're flying in the plane, and all of a sudden you're climbing, 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 and all of a sudden the baby two rows up, starts screaming like crazy because the pressure is really building up in there. Hopefully the mother will nurse the baby or use a bottle, uh, and that sucking action will help to, to open up that, that canal. So in, in infants particularly, this is a relatively straight shot from the pharynx up into this, uh, this middle ear cavity. As we age, we start to get a little bit more of a bend in that eustachian tube, 
Uh, but for infants, it's a real problem because bacteria can move up into that middle ear cavity, and of course, then they have a middle ear infection. When you have young kids, you just expect it. That's going to happen. They're going to get some infections. Nathan had a fair amount of them. They start rubbing their ear, grabbing their ear. They have a fever. Um, so they, they have this, this infection. And most kids, the infection will pass. They can take them to the doctor, but uh, usually the infection will pass. Um, it used to be pretty regularly that they would give them antibiotics. They're trying not to do that so much now because the bacteria are becoming resistant to the, the antibiotics. If the child has repeated infections, where this happens a lot, they worry about damage occurring to the ossicles and the tympanic membrane. The tympanic membrane can actually rupture. Uh, and so the physician may recommend that small tubes be put into the tympanic membrane. Uh, so they can actually go in and put a little tiny tube in there that allows the fluid that's accumulating from the bacteria to leave. It's a one-way tube and the pressure to leave. As the child ages, the tympanic membrane will heal itself and push the little tube out right, so that they don't have to have that anymore. Okay, so that's the middle ear. Let's go to the inner ear. So the innermost ear. Uh, this is where we're going to actually be able to create electrical impulses for us to, to hear. So the, the structure in our inner ear is called the cochlea. It looks pretty much like a snail shell. Right? It looks like that to me anyway. Right? So it looks like a, a snail shell. Uh, it actually has two different windows in it. We've already learned one of the windows uh, is called the oval window, not shown in this diagram because they did a cutaway. There's another window that we call the round window because obviously it's round. It has a small membrane over the top of that. Let's go back here just for a second. All right, so they're trying to show there's our oval window, the stapes, and here's that round window with the membrane. The cochlea is fluid filled. You cannot compress fluid. So when the stapes pushes in, right, carrying the vibration in and pushes in, the fluid needs some way to bulge out. The round window is that pressure relief. Right? So when the stapes pushes in, the round window can bulge to allow the pressure to, to bulge out in for that, that push in. Now, I said that it's fluid filled. Uh, it turns out there really are three different tubes in there. Okay, so it's really three different tubes. So here they've taken uh, the cochlea and unwound it for us. And so inside here we see three different tubes. Up on top here is the vestibular canal. If you want, you can call it the scala vestibuli if you want to use your Latin, but it's the vestibular tube. Here we have the or vestibular duct. Here's the cochlear duct. And down here we have the tympanic duct. Okay, so vestibular duct, cochlear duct, tympanic duct. In order to get three ducts, we had to have some membranes in there to separate them. All right, so this membrane is called the vestibular membrane. This one between the the tympanic duct and the cochlear duct is called the basilar membrane. Right? So basilar membrane there, and then between the cochlear duct and the vestibular duct, the vestibular membrane. It's trying to show you that the vestibular duct and the tympanic duct are filled with a fluid that we call perilymph, and the cochlear duct is filled with a fluid called endolymph. These fluids vary slightly in their electrolytes, which helps to set up the action potential. It's really a resting potential, but then a, an action potential that we'll, we'll get to in a minute. <clears throat> All right, so three different tubes, three different ducts inside a single big tube, the, the cochlea. We need to take a closer look at, at this basilar membrane here and the structure that's sitting we're going to come back to that. Here's a, uh, a nice three-dimensional drawing, right? The narcissist has done, right? So uh, 
here's this cochlear duct, here's the basilar membrane, here's the vestibular membrane. I want people to take a look at this structure right here because this is something that we call the organ of corti, and it's the organ of hearing. And this is where we're actually going to, to hear. Let's take a look here. So they've taken that area and magnified it, of course. So here's the organ of corti, there's the basilar membrane, and that organ of corti consists of specialized hair cells that sit on the basilar membrane, and not shown here, but I can show you here, sitting on top of, of, of these little hair cells are these little hairs, these little cilia. So maybe you can kind of see them in this diagram there. So sitting on top, those hair cells have little cilia that protrude out, and they touch the tectorial membrane that's just above it. All right, so here's that cochlear duct, basal membrane, Here's the organ of corti, hair cells that are being just slightly touched by this tectorial membrane. Uh, and those hair cells are what actually produce action potentials. So let's look at the physiology of hearing. How it is that we actually produce the, the electrical impulses that we produce? Remember, these are going to be mechanoreceptors. We learned that already, right? So some mechanical movement is going to stimulate these, these hair cells. So we know the sound waves strike the tympanic membrane. The ossicles are going to move. The stapes is going to move like a piston in the old window. And of course, the basilar membrane has to be able to, uh, excuse me, the round window has to be able to bulge out. When the stapes pushes in that old window, it pushes against the paralymph and it causes a pressure wave in the fluid. I kind of picture this, folks, like pushing on a water bed. You push on a water bed, and the top of the mattress is going to move. That membrane is going to move. So as that wave passes through the inner ear, that is going to cause the basilar membrane to move. And when the basilar membrane moves, So they're trying to show the bulge here. When that basilar membrane moves, it causes those hair cells to hit that tectorial membrane, and the movement of those little hair cells creates action potentials that send the impulses then over the vestibular cochlear nerve to our, our brain, right to the, the temporal lobe of the brain, and we're able to do that. And then around the will has the bulge to relieve that, that pressure. I have a link. Let's see if it'll work for me today. Uh, it's kind of big on showing film, but this actually shows, uh, it's pretty short, but it, it shows how this occurs. And um, pretty good little link here if it'll come up for us. I think that they mentioned this just then is that when we try to pick up different frequencies, we have different areas of the basilar membrane that respond to the different frequencies. This is because the basilar membrane has areas that are relatively thin, if you will, and very tight uh, fibers attached to it. And then there are areas that are thicker and have thicker fibers that attach to it. So if we were to lay this out in a straight line, we find down in this area very tight little fibers holding the, the basilar membrane, uh, this in relatively loose ones and thicker fibers. So it's trying to show you that our high frequency sounds are heard down here uh, near the oval window. The low frequencies are up there. I kind of picture this as a trampoline, right? So if you went and jumped down in this area, you'd get nice big bounces, right? Boom, boom. But if you're trying to jump in this area, you just have little tiny bounces, beep, 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 right? Because it's so tight. Uh, so when the vibrations come into the, uh, the cochlea, certain areas resonate with the sound, and so one area will vibrate more than another. It's really very similar to what it looks like if you open the lid to a grand piano or a baby grand piano, right? So one end, has very short, tight strings. The other end has very long, thick strings. 
think of a violin or a guitar, same kind of thing, right? Before they ever, ever saw into the inner ear, they should have known what it was gonna look like, right? Because the reason that we created a baby grand piano or a grand piano was because our senses were able to take those impulses and turn them into sounds, right? So the different frequencies are caused by different areas vibrating, it also mentioned that for amplitude, you get more movement, right? So more fluid moves and more areas on the basal membrane, move more areas of the organ of corti uh, are able to be stimulated. Uh, it's kind of interesting that if you think about dogs being able to hear a lot higher frequencies than we hear, if they were to create musical instruments, they wouldn't be the same as our musical instruments, right? They would be different uh, because they're able to hear things different than all right, so uh, deafness. What happens if we go deaf? There are lots of causes of deafness, but we can put them into two major types of deafness, one called conduction deafness, one called nerve deafness, all right? So conduction deafness and nerve de deafness. Conduction deafness means you have a problem conducting the vibrations into the cochlea. So this could be you have excessive earwax in your, your uh, uh, external auditory meatus. You might have damage to your tympanic membrane. You might have damage to your ossicles. You're not able to get the vibrations in. Relatively easy to correct with hearing aids because we can give the person a hearing aid that consists of a microphone that you can wear behind the ear and it simply vibrates the mastoid process which sends the vibrations into the inner ear. Those of you who have lab, we got to play with this a little bit with, with tuning forks. Uh, so that would be conduction deafness. The other type of that damage would be nerve deafness, where there's something wrong with the organ of corti or the vestibular cochlear nerve, right? So uh, you're not able to actually create the action potentials or, or have those carry to the temporal lobe. Um, harder to correct this, right, because now you actually have uh, damage to the, the impulses getting to the, the temporal lobe. Uh, hearing aids can be used. They have lots of different hearing aids available now. Since the invention of the microchip, hearing aids have gotten much better. So in the old days, they simply amplified sounds for people, uh, which made it really hard uh, because uh, your ears are really good at, at filtering out excessive sounds that you don't want to hear. If you're at a party, right, there's all kinds of background noise, but your ears can filter that out and just concentrate on what you're trying to listen to. If you have something that amplifies all the sounds, you can imagine trying to hear right, somebody speaking in that, that crowd. Uh, they have very sophisticated filters in these uh, hearing aids now. Also, they can change the tone. So very commonly, the tones that are lost are high frequency, uh, and so they can drop the tones into lower frequencies and allow people to, to hear things. Um, they've done experiments working with all kinds of different animals to, to see what's occurring. Uh, and it turns out that if you expose the ear to lots of loud uh, sounds over periods of time, the little hair cells get beaten down. And eventually they just don't come up. Uh, I saw a... Uh, a photo of, uh, of an experiment that they did on hamsters years ago. Uh, they actually went in and took a look at the little organ of corti hair cells after exposure to a very loud sound. And it almost looked to me like uh, the wind had come into a wheat field or a rice field where all the hair cells were laying down. Kyle. So when you go to a concert and you're listening to music over time, you have a ring in your ear the next day. Why is that? Yeah, so those, so Kyle asked about the ringing, but you not only have ringing, you also have some hair loss, from hearing, hearing loss, right? Uh, so you pound those hair cells down, and it takes a while for them to come back up, and, but when they're pounded down, they're gonna start sending impulses. When I was a kid, I went to, I was a kid, when I was a young adult, I went to lots and lots of really loud concerts. I heard people you guys don't know who I'm even talking about. <laughs> Like, I saw Jimi Hendrix three times. I saw Steppenwolf and Janis Joplin. Right, people you guys don't even know what I'm talking about. Maybe you know Jimi Hendrix, but, uh, right? Uh, but we would come out of the concert and we'd be really excited. That was a great concert! And, and my girlfriend would say, what? Right? <laughs> and then, you know, I'd get home, my ears would be ringing like crazy, and I'd wake up the next morning and I could hear things 
uh, again. Uh, but right, that pounding down of the hair cells means that for a while they're not going to be able to respond, and they're going to cause these impulses, and you're going to end up with some ringing, some, some tinnitus in, in the ears. I have some high frequency hearing loss, I'm sure, from all the uh, really loud concerts that I went to. Yes? Why do the hairs have such a hard time regenerating or no capacity? You know, why do they have such a, you know, uh, I don't know that I have an easy answer to that other than maybe uh, if, if you look at evolution, it wasn't necessary for them to do much regeneration, right? So the, the, these high frequency losses, the, the, the nerve deafness is really pretty much a modern society loss. If you go to, to primitive cultures, they'll have some loss, but it's nothing like what we have. Uh, we're exposed to really loud sounds, and right, I mean, this was, gosh, this was probably 15, 20 years ago, they did a study where they went to a mall and they stopped every young person that had uh, the, the ear, ear, um, uh, yeah, you couldn't think of it. Anyway, had, we're listening to their own stereos, right? Uh, they stopped them and they measured the loudness. Of course, loudness is measured, you know, this probably in decibels. They measured the loudness of the, the level of loudness the, the kids were listening to. And in about two thirds of the times, Right, so close to 66%, the levels that they were listening to were above OSHA standards for safety in the workplace. That is, if, if the workplace was that loud, OSHA would have required the use of, of earplugs. And this is how loud they were listening to them. Right, and so that constant exposure to the very loud sound damages the organ of corti, those, those little hair cells that are in there. I, uh, my brother-in-law is now deceased, but when he was alive, he had severe hearing loss. He was stationed at Fort Ord many, many years ago when it was active, and he was kind of a gunner's mate, if you will, that's a Navy term, but his job was to assist with uh, la launching uh, mortar, and they didn't even give him earplugs. And so they would run around and pick up uh, cigarette filters and stick those in his ears uh, for earplugs, but Right? I mean, he had severe hearing loss from being exposed to these really, really loud sounds. And um, If we're working with someone who doesn't hear well, like an older person, is it more typically loss of high, uh, high frequency yeah. so that it, to speak in a deeper voice yeah. can so help them? the high frequency that's most commonly lost. And if you think about it, these are really stiff fibers, right? And so it makes sense that when really loud sounds come in, that's what they're going to So stand. try and talk in a deep voice. Talk in a deeper <laughs> voice. That, that will help. So uh, we have hearing aids um, for severe hearing loss. They can do cochlear implants. These have been around for a, a long time now, 25 years or, or more. Uh, so if the problem is that the organ of corti can't respond, then the idea is well, let's bypass the <coughs> transducer, right? So they connect a microphone to the person, and then they put a wire into their, their cochlea that touches the auditory nerve. So the microphone will pick up the sound, send it to the inside here, the, the stimulator, which stimulates then the, the auditory nerve, and you bypass the whole organ of corti, right? You just bypass the system and give them the ability to hear. When they first started this, they had only four electrodes. Uh, gosh, it's been probably five years since I checked. They were up to like 24 electrodes. They probably have a lot more now. Eventually, right, they're going to have so many electrodes that the quality of hearing will be similar to what you and I hear. Uh, people that are, are deaf are thrilled to be able to hear again. Right? And, and with a limited number of electrodes, they report that it, it's a little bit like watching a Donald Duck or something, right? So the sounds don't sound quite right uh, if they've been able to hear before, right? They can report this. But still, to be able to hear when they couldn't hear before is, is incredible. If you think about it, there is no reason why they would have to limit them to the sound waves that you and I hear. They could have them listen to high frequencies, just like a dog hears, right? I mean, you just adjust the microphone, so that it picks up whatever sound waves and stimulates whatever you want it to, to stimulate. So we're talking about bionic ears, essentially. Um, like I said, these cochlear implants have been around for quite a while. There is some controversy even still uh, in the hearing impaired as to whether or not you should give cochlear implants to, to young children uh, with the idea that some people feel that there's nothing wrong with uh, learning to sign. 
right? And so another language skill, you learn to sign, there's no reason to give them cochlear implants. I don't really buy that one too much, right? It's kind of like saying, well, there's nothing wrong with being blind, don't give people glasses, right? If you have the ability to, to help people, let them uh, be helped by having these, these cochlear implants. Is the cochlear, is that the, ear, the actual eardrum? No, so we're not doing the eardrum. We're bypassing, there's the eardrum here. We're bypassing all of that. Run the electrodes all the way into the cochlea and you have those electrodes on the auditory nerve. Uh, I had a student, gosh, which was in this class, I hate to say it, probably 30 years ago. He was uh, in my class. He was a mechanical engineer. Uh, got really interested in anatomy and physiology, went back to school at UC Berkeley at Cal, got his master's degree in, in biomechanical engineering, got even more excited, went back to the University of Wisconsin where he got his PhD in biomechanical engineering, uh, and has been working for many years at doing essentially these kind of bionic ears, bionic vision, if you will, bypassing the, the systems that exist. Much of his work has been uh, working on the ability to help people that are blind to see again. Uh, and there's lots of people working on this. They're trying to do uh, photoreceptor implants into the retina. Really hard to do because the, the eye moves so quickly, any kind of weight at all is, tends not to stick on the retina. So the group that, that my friend Mitch has worked with uh, went a whole other route. Initially, uh, what they did is they put a camera on the person's glasses uh, and they tried to put an electrical array on the abdomen so that they would uh, send impulses to the abdomen and the person would feel on the abdomen where what they were looking at. So if you saw a chair, the electrodes would fire and say, oh, I feel a chair. Didn't work too well because, right, we know that the sensory units are way scattered, if you will, on the, the abdomen. Eventually, they hit upon the idea of putting the electrodes on a, a little lollipop, if you will, that fits onto the tongue. And so these people that they have done this to can now see with their tongue, uh, which is kind of a strange concept, but right, you give them uh, a little camera, it sends the impulses onto their, their tongue. Let's see if this link will, will work. I hate to waste my time on these things, but it's still pretty cool if you can bypass the system is not functioning. Mitch's group is now working on uh, on being able to bypass the, uh, the semicircular canals and the utricle and sacral so that you can help people have problems with equilibrium. Or if you were a diver in muddy water, a SEAL, for instance, much of their research is being funded by the Department of Defense, you would be able to know what is up and what is down even if you were in uh, really cloudy water. Um, and again, there's no reason to be stuck with the in images or impulses that we discover or we feel, right? They can change these things to whatever they, they want. Anyway, pretty, pretty cool stuff. Uh, Mitch told me that he could teach me in 30 minutes to be able to catch a rolling ball on a table with this device. Uh, that I'd be able to, re to reach out and find it using this, right? Blindfolded, not being able to hear, but I'd be able to pick it up. Hey, anyway, let's keep moving. So, um, Another part of, of senses, special senses is equilibrium. Uh, certainly uh, inner ears involved, that's what we're going to look at now, but you have vision and proprioception that are also important, right? So we, we use our eyes and we use our proprioceptors to, to give us the, the feeling of equilibrium. If we look inside the inner ear, we know about the cochlea, but it turns out there are some other structures that are in here so there's the cochlea, but in the vestibular apparatus, this whole thing's called the vestibular apparatus, there are two structures in here called the utricle and the saccule. So they're trying to show the utricle here, uh, over here, they're trying to show the saccule. These two structures are involved in detecting linear acceleration. And they detect linear acceleration. So changes of speed that occur in a straight line, right? linear acceleration. And they do this by using some specialized structures inside them called the maculae. One would be a macula. So this diagram is trying to show uh, what this looks like. Shouldn't surprise us to find hair cells again. Right? So these are, are hair cells that are, that are in the 
in your ear, but not for hearing now. This is for equilibrium. So we have this structure called the macula. Think of it as kind of made of jello with these hair cells. And there they are. And then sitting on top of the macula are some little tiny calcium stones that we call otoliths. And they give mass. They help to add mass to the, the macula. Some weight. So if we move the jello suddenly, the hair cells will move, and it tells us we're experiencing linear acceleration. You could do this experiment on your own home. Get a cube of jello, set it on a plate, and move the plate quickly. And what we will notice happen to the jello? It wiggles. It will jiggle, right? So that movement of the, the jello, the macula, moves the hair cells and says, you are experiencing linear acceleration. We have two different structures in each of our ears, one a utricle, one a saccule. These two different structures detect linear acceleration either vertically or horizontally. It turns out that the utricle is going to detect it horizontally. And I always remembered this because I had to cross my T in the utricle word. And of course, that was a horizontal cross. The saccule detects linear acceleration in the vertical direction. Uh, when Nathan was young, I used to take him up to, to uh, Great America, up in the San Jose area. And one of my favorite rides up there uh, was the drop zone. Right? He liked it too, right? So you, they pull you up, and then they drop you suddenly. Now, if you were completely blindfolded, had no ability to hear, guess what? If they dropped you, you would still know that you were dropped. How did I know I was dropped? The saccule, right? So that jello structure, the macula, inside the saccule was stimulated when I had linear acceleration, in this case, in a vertical direction. Same thing happens in a horizontal uh, direction. You also feel it in your feet, though. Uh, there, we have pressure receptors everywhere, but yeah. um, I, you know, it, it, let's assume that you're inside like, some kind of a container where there's none. I don't mm. feel it in your feet. Um, I always so feel if, it. If your feet, I'm assuming that, I'm not talking about proprioception now. Mm -hmm. well, I'm assuming that your feet are not on the ground, right? So uh, free flow. Uh, That's free different yeah. than, than uh -huh. Than, yeah. you know, than proprioception. Yeah, I always feel it on the elevator, though. Yeah, but you that's know, when the it stops. proprioception. Huh. Semicircular canals. Also, <laughs> we have semicircular canals that detect uh, angular acceleration. So we had linear acceleration, but angular acceleration, that is angular acceleration that's occurring when they change. So we're talking about spinning or turning acceleration. If we look at the semicircular canals, they are fluid filled. Okay, so we have fluid filled canals. There are three of them, so you maybe learned them in anatomy or in our physiology lab. Three semicircular canals that are arranged at right angles to each other. All right, so if you imagine the room, if the room was square, if the wall that runs this way would be called the superior semicircular canal. The back wall would be called posterior semicircular canal. And the floor would be called the horizontal. Uh, sometimes people call it the lateral. Sometimes even called the inferior semicircular canal. So we've got three semicircular canals arranged at right angles to each other. I'm going to say a really nasty word over your ears. Geometry. <laughs> in geometry, you learn that if you have three planes at right angles to each other, you can describe any point in space. Right? Any point in space with three planes, the x, y, and z plane. So we've got three semicircular canals so that any movement that I do with my head that involves a change in angle, at least one of them will be stimulated. And right, I can't do any movement in space without one of being simulated. Let's stop there. On uh, Wednesday, we'll talk more about how this works. We're going to move on. Uh, an Irish joke, if you'll bear with me. So, three Irishmen uh, stumble out of a pub late at night. They actually end up in a uh, uh, 
a graveyard, and uh, one Irishman looks at the headstone there, he says, ah, oh, looky here, Timothy O'Malley. He passed away at 93. And the other one says, ah, oh, that's nothing. Over here's Lindsay O'Grady. He passed away at 98. And the third one says, ah, oh, here's one that passed away at 145. He said, 145, what's his name? He says, just a minute. He likes to ask this. Miles from Dublin. <laughs> All right. So, my apologies if you're Irish. <laughs> so, uh, we looked at uh, equilibrium last time. We looked at the utricle and the saccule. We learned that inside the utricle and the saccule, each had a structure called a macula that's sensitive to linear acceleration, right? So acceleration in a straight line. Uh, we said that horizontal, that we had the utricle, and that vertical, we had the saccule. So we had just started talking about the three semicircular canals, and we learned that there, the three semicircular canals are oriented at right angles to each other so that we can detect movement in any direction in space if they are sensitive to angular acceleration. These semicircular canals are filled with fluid. So inside we have fluid. At the ends of each semicircular canal, there's a raised area, something called an ampulla. Plural would be, of course, ampullae. And if we look inside each ampulla, we find a ridge that we call a crista ampullaris, the whole apparatus here. And in that crista ampullaris, there's a structure called the cupula. Once again, the cupula has hair cells. Okay, so we have the hair cells again, and they are sensitive to mechanical motion, right? So they're going to be sensitive to, to movement, mechanical movement. The semicircular canals, I said, respond to angular acceleration so that when you start to have a change in angle, the fluid initially stays stationary, right? So it stays stationary. Can I borrow your water bottle just for a second? Yes. So if this was a semicircular canal filled with fluid, when I first move it, the fluid can't keep up with the bottle, right? So because there's inertia in that water, right, stays there for a minute, the ampulla, the, the cupula, excuse me, the cupula moves relative to the fluid. You stimulate those hair cells and your brain says, oh, angular acceleration. By having semicircular canals, we're able to do rapid predictive movements. So that if you run to the corner here and you only had linear detectors, then as I would start to turn, I'd have to fall, right, stimulate the horizontal, right, saccule, and say, oh, I'm turning, I assume, uh, mutual pull, I meant. I'm turning, but if I have semicircular canals, I can turn my head, and as soon as I turn my head, guess what? I get predictive stimulation. Say, so, oh, look, I'm getting angular acceleration correct before that angular acceleration ahead of time. So you can do rapid, fast movements as long as you can detect the angular acceleration. There is a particular uh, reflex movement of the eye that we call nystagmus. Those of you in lab got a chance to see this. It's an interesting reflex. <clears throat> when you experience angular acceleration, that angular acceleration will stimulate the eyes to move quickly in the direction of movement and slowly back in the opposite direction. Because when you're spinning, your eyes don't actually stay with the orbit. So if I start to spin, they're going to hold, 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 and then they quickly jump forward. Hold, 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 quickly jump forward in the direction that I'm spinning. Of course, those of you in lab know that if we spin somebody and stop them, the fluid in the semicircular canal sloshes, and it's as if they start motion in the other direction, so they get nystagmus in the opposite direction. Okay, so that's it for our sensory system.